asked yesterday in the tutorial how many of you have heard about the PEO of professional engineering, and most of you had. Here's a small handout on that. Please pass this around. Um, engineering without being a professional and holding a professional engineering license. So for those of you that will go on after you've graduated and work as an engineer in this province and you wish to hold the title of an engineer, the fact that you've graduated here and paid all your fees to Mac doesn't entitle you to call yourself an engineer. That may be something of a bit of a surprise to you, but it's no different to doctors, lawyers, dentists, any of these professional activities where you interact with the public on a daily basis and the actions that you take and interact with the public can have consequences. Okay, so much like lawyers and dentists and doctors and those professions, they can have significant influence on people's lives. They also have professional bodies that regulate their practice. And so they cannot just go and open a, a medical facility and practice as a doctor or as a dentist without being appropriately licensed. So engineers, we have, have a similar body. So Professional Engineers Ontario and in this act tells what we can and cannot do as engineers. So the first point there in your handout is they exist then to regulate what we call the practice of professional engineering. some additional goals as well and the PEO is responsible for maintaining standards of knowledge and skill, making sure that people that are licensed have those necessary standards of skill and knowledge. So if you look down in your handouts, if you wish to obtain a professional engineering license, there's, there's several criteria you have to meet. Firstly, you have to be 18 years of age and secondly, of good character. So when you apply for your license, you have several referees that you state on your application. And some of those referees are usually professional engineers as well. So they're going to vouch for your character. And uh, they phone them up. So I've been going through this process myself and um, had to send out several referees and they comment on your, your capability and on your character. The third criteria is that you successfully complete the professional practice examination. So in several years from now, if you choose to go for that, you will have to read this this little book on law for professional engineers and this book on ethics, and it's self-directed learning. Okay? So study all of that on your own time and write that three-hour exam where there's various legal case studies, ethical case studies, and we'll look at one of those case studies in tomorrow's class. In fact. So that's the third criteria. The fourth criteria is that you have to have 48 months of verifiable engineering experience. It doesn't have to be in Canada, but 12 months must be in Canada. So 48 months of total engineering experience, that's four years, and co-op applies. 
So all your co-op experience counts up to a maximum of 12 months. So if you had 16 months of co-op, you can count 12 of that way. Okay. And then the fifth criteria that's not written in there is you need an undergraduate degree from a CEAB accredited university. Okay. So the fact that you graduated from MAC qualifies for that fifth criteria. We spend a lot of time behind the scenes making sure our program here at the university is accredited by the CEAB. So you require a CEAB accredited undergrad degree. Now if you're studying outside Canada, you just need your degree um, audited by the professional engineering body. And so you'll see today in JHE, for example, the PEO exams that are taking place in JHE. Those are people that have studied outside Canada. Their degrees are not recognized. So they have to come back and write all sorts of exams on reactor design, heat transfer, fluid mechanics. So the fact that you graduate from MAC means that you don't get to write those exams. right? So that's one thing that you, uh, one benefit you get from your degree is that you are automatically CEAB accredited and you meet criteria at least one, hopefully you meet criteria two and five. So is the accreditation like, uh, is that good for the states as well or just Canada? The accreditation is for Canadian, but there's reciprocal agreements. So for example, my degree from the University of Cape Town is recognized by CEAB because they've been, they've been this cross accreditation between the agencies. Is there a time limit on it? Like if you go off and just another five years and then want to I'm not sure. Yeah. So there's lots about this program I don't know the answers to, but their website has a lot of these detailed information, especially when it comes to co-ops and so on. Yes. Most of these most of the US states do it individually. And, and uh, almost none of them would accept this because almost all of them require the examinations, even if, if you come from an accredited. So the California state, he used, he used focus textbook and he had all those problems, the really difficult ones, were the California state accreditation problems. So that it can be very difficult to get a, a license in some jurisdictions. It's much easier here. What about if you want to practice in the province of Canada? Okay. So PH in Ontario, there is, you can practice engineering in a different province in Canada if you have your PH, but you need to apply for a license in that province first. And it's almost always granted. But there's so there's reciproc reciprocating agreements between the different provinces. So we come, let's come back here quickly to the practice of engineering. Okay, so that's defined for you in the bottom of the page. There's three criteria that, that the government, so when you read this act, it's carefully defined what they mean by engineering. And if you read that last three bullet points, A, B, and C, those are and. So it's a and B and C, if you meet all three, then you're practicing engineering and you need a license. So the first one is if you're planning, designing, composing, evaluating, advising, reporting, directing, or supervising, and you're doing that by applying engineering principles, such as heat transfer, fluid mechanics, reactor design, hazard and operability studies, and thirdly, it concerns the safeguarding of life, health, property, economic interests, the public welfare and environment for managing of any such act. If you're doing any of those three combined, then you do need a license. Okay, and there's several licenses available. There's the full license, which is the PNG that we know, the back at the top of the page. There's several other temporary licenses. These are for people that come and visit Canada for a period of time and, and work on consulting projects. Provisional licenses, limited licenses, certificate of authorization, these are for companies. And then the last one that concerns you is EIT. You don't need to wait four years from now to apply for your professional engineering designation. You can apply as soon as you graduate for an EIT, an engineering and training. You're working under a PH, and that makes, your, makes things just a little easier for you. Okay? So you can still work in a role that is considered an engineering role, just the person supervising you, they're taking responsibility for your work. So EIT is not required, but it certainly looks good when you come to applying later on for your full license. So if you choose, after graduation, to open your own consulting business, 
Brian Incorporated and sell your services as an engineer, that's illegal. Okay? You cannot call yourself an engineer without this license because you're doing A, B, and C. So the, the Act, the Professional Engineering Act, says no person shall engage in the practice of engineering or hold himself, herself, or itself as an engaging in the practice of engineering unless you're holding a license of some sort. So it's, it, it was very surprising to me at first, when, but it, it's part of the regulations, whether you choose to agree with it or disagree with it, that's immaterial, the government and the PEO enforce this. Okay, so just be aware of the fact that graduating, getting your iron ring, any of those activities doesn't mean that you can go out and call yourself an engineer. You have to meet these criteria of four years of experience, one of which is in Canada, and then write the people okay, and have your character references. So that's just something to be aware of. Part of this act is also related to engineering ethics. We'll talk about that tomorrow. So I have a handout of the code of ethics here. I'd like you to take it today and at least read it over so that tomorrow you don't get surprised by these two pages of the code of ethics. We will work through a case study and wrap up the course. Tomorrow. So make sure you grab one of these handouts.